I am going to talk about something you all know about and that you all do every day. And I am going to talk to you about this because I want you to understand what we, uh, a number of uh, neuro-ophthalmologists and, and vascular stroke neurologists around the country, have been trying to teach ophthalmologists so that you understand why you are going to start getting strange phone calls from your local ophthalmologist within the next few months. And so some of what I'm going to say is going to seem pretty basic to you because you're going to say, well, yes, of course I'm doing that. I'm not stupid, okay? But think about what I'm saying as if you were an ophthalmologist who is in practice, doesn't do stroke neurology, does not necessarily have access to an emergency facility easily, uh, does not admit patients to the hospital, and certainly wants nothing to do with this kind of patients. This is not why most ophthalmologists choose the field of ophthalmology, not to take care of these patients. And so um, I don't have any relevant disclosure. I'm a dis consultant for Genside Biologics, which uh, takes care of gene therapy for labor hereditary optic neuropathy. And what I want to emphasize today is recently published studies on acute retinal ischemia, discuss recent guidelines for the management of patients with acute retinal ischemia, and help you understand why there is an absolute need to develop a local network to improve the care of these patients who usually present to ophthalmologists or optometrists actually most often, and not to you at all. You see them way uh, later down the road. And so it's a very simple case. It's a 61-year-old man with acute vision loss in one eye, okay? And in ophthalmology, honestly, we don't need any more history than that. It's acute, it's vision loss, it's one eye, let's look at the eye. And you look at the eye and you know what's going on and then you're done. And if you know what to do, great. And if you can fix it, great. And if you don't know what to do and you can't fix it, you send it to your favorite neuro-ophthalmologist or neurologist because you just want to get rid of the patient as fast as you can. And so... Here is what you see, and you have basically three options. You either see, ooh, that's scary. You, hold on, let me go back. I need to master the system. Okay, you can either see central retinal artery occlusion, or you're going to see a branch retinal artery occlusion. And for us ophthalmologists, this is really easy to diagnose. Or you're going to see nothing because the patient tells you, oh, my vision is back, and it's a transient vascular visual loss, so the equivalent of a retinal transient ischemic attack, retinal TIA, correct? And the reason why I put all of them in under the same um, term, which is what I call acute retinal arterial ischemia, it's because they are the same. And as neurologists, you know very well that indeed Ischemia, whether transient or permanent, means ischemia, and therefore it's bad. And the cardiologists were the first ones many, many, many years ago to tell us, well, whether you have angina or an acute MI, we call it acute coronary syndrome, and it's really bad. Well, neurologists have been saying for the past 20 years that if you have transient ischemic attack versus acute ischemic stroke, it's under the same concept of acute cerebrovascular syndrome, and it's really bad. Ophthalmologists do not think like that at all. If it's transient, and if the fundus is normal, and there are no retinal emboli, and there is no permanent retinal ischemia, and it went away, can't be that bad, correct? It went away. Everybody is happy. And if you see a central retinal artery occlusion or a branch retinal artery occlusion, most ophthalmologists are very concerned about the visual outcome because usually it results in devastating visual loss with very poor potential for visual recovery. But most ophthalmologists do not really grasp the importance of acting very quickly uh, to prevent a subsequent stroke or recurrent stroke. And when I say very quickly is what they don't, they all know it's an emergency, obviously, and that patients are at very, very high risk of stroke and, cerebral and uh, cardiovascular death. But what they don't understand is what the definition of very quickly is. And this definition of very quickly has dramatically changed even among uh, the neurology community and stroke uh, uh, services within the past 15 years, as I will show you. So what I tell ophthalmologists is stop thinking 
My patients had a branch retinal artery occlusion or a central retinal artery occlusion or transient monocular vision loss of vascular mechanism. Instead, think my patient has acute retinal ischemia. I really don't care what the fundus looks like. And I emphasize to the ophthalmologists that the reason why they care about it is because it's the same vascular territory as the brain, and the causes and mechanisms are exactly the same as cerebral ischemia, as you know. And I want to emphasize, and that's really for you neurologists, because the ophthalmologists know about that, that we are not talking at all about optic nerve ischemia. What we call ischemic optic neuropathy has absolutely nothing to do with what I'm talking about today. We are talking about acute retinal ischemia. The blood supply to the optic nerve is completely separate from the blood supply to the retina. So we are not talking about the same disease. We are not talking about the same pathophysiology. And no acute optic nerve ischemia should not be taken care of like a stroke. It is not the same thing. And I will mention it very briefly at the end today. So what everybody knows is that Obviously, if you have an acute retinal ischemia, your visual outcome is compromised. And that's really the only difference between acute cerebral ischemia and acute ocular ischemia. Cerebral ischemia, you're worried about the neurologic outcome. Ocular ischemia, we're worried about the ocular visual outcome. But the patient is exactly the same. The management is exactly the same. What many people have emphasized over the past 40 years probably, is that it's not really the same because the prognosis of patients who present with a stroke involving the eye, acute arterial retinal ischemia, their prognosis is actually better than the prognosis of a patient, and I'm talking about from a systemic standpoint, than the prognosis of a patient who presents with an acute cerebral ischemic event. And the problem is people have emphasized that the prognosis is better. And this is so wrong. It makes me terribly angry because it has sent the completely wrong message to the ophthalmology community. The prognosis is not better. The prognosis is not as bad, which is completely different. And so people have published the prognosis is better. And ophthalmologists have said, I told you so. The prognosis is better. Let's take our sweet time when the reality is the prognosis is not as bad, which matters for you because your secondary prevention may end up being a little bit less aggressive if it's an ocular ischemic problem compared with a cerebral ischemic problem, but the prognosis is really bad. And, and I am going to show you that. And so just you know, a few, a few studies which have emphasized that. This is a, a study from 2010, so not such a long time ago in the US, which stroke symptoms prompt a 911 call. And you know very well that the main reason why you cannot administer TPA to every single stroke patient is because they arrive too late. So can you imagine how late they arrive when they just lost vision loss? When they just had vision loss compared with a hemiparesis? Patients don't care about it. They wait. And then if it doesn't go away, they go to the local optometry shop, presume, preferably at you know, Sam's Club or Walmart or in the mall, where they really do not care, do not get appropriate uh, uh, urgent evaluation. And then it takes three days to have them see an ophthalmologist who will then take three days to send you the patient. And then we're one week later, and we know very well that one week later is too late. So patients do not call 911 when they have a stroke. But when they have vision loss, they call 911 even less often, as you can imagine. This is a sub-study from the NASET published in 1995, which emphasized that the average time from onset of TIA to treatment was 48 days when patients had a retinal TIA compared with two weeks when patients had a hemispheric TIA. So NASET early 90s you see that two weeks was considered fast after a cerebral TIA, which we know now is completely unacceptable. But 48 days after a retinal TIA, there is no point in even looking at the patient 48 days later. If they have not had a stroke, they won't have a stroke. They'll be fine. Um, you are very much aware that in 2011, the American Heart Association and, and Society of Vascular Surgeons published recommendations regarding the best timing for carotid endarterectomy in patients who have a significant carotid stenosis, symptomatic carotid stenosis. 
And it would make very clear that you have to do surgery within two weeks to make it worth it, and that the earlier you do it, the better you are in terms of secondary prevention. And so this is 2011, and it has pushed uh, the neurology community to act way faster in terms of making the decision of offering a carotid anatorectomy in selected patients who, who may need it. Well, 2012, so one year after this publication, it prompted a Canadian uh, team to actually look at what was happening when the symptom was a retinal TIA. And the carotid surgery was delayed by one to two months, which basically made it not necessary to do the carotid anatorectomy anymore because the benefit risk was not in favor of carotid surgery when you wait so long. People have kept looking, and I'm just showing you this paper, which is from uh, Europe, from Sweden, actually, I believe, um, published in 2016. But there has been many since 2012, 2016, where they basically again emphasize that in a country that is extraordinarily well organized in terms of transportation of patient, information of the patient population, information of the healthcare providers, only 32% of patients had carot who needed carotid anatorectomy had carotid surgery within two weeks when the presented symptom was visual loss, emphasizing that it doesn't matter how many studies we do, it doesn't matter how many articles we write, it doesn't matter how many guidelines we publish, the ophthalmology community does not send these patients to the stroke community fast enough because they do not understand why they should. In 2009, we were, think, we were awaiting results of a big clinical trial coming from Germany, evaluating the use of uh, intra-arterial thrombolysis for central retinal artery occlusion. And we said, well, we need to get ready because they're going to show positive results, and we need to be able to have access to patients with central retinal artery occlusion in a timely fashion. Let's see what ophthalmologists do. And let's try to start a campaign locally to incite optometrists and ophthalmologists to send us these patients very quickly so that we can do thrombolysis. And so the first thing we did was a little survey, and we were shocked. So Georgia physicians basically told us, if I'm a neuro-ophthalmologist, 86% of those neuro-ophthalmologists sent CR... So we're talking about very acute central retinal artery occlusion patients, okay, who lost vision within the previous few hours. 86% of neuro-ophthalmologists in Georgia will send their patients to the ER. 73% of neurologists would. 35% of ophthalmologists said, I'm sending patients to the ER. And then when we said, but why don't you? And it was because it's my patient. I don't want to lose my patient. And my patients don't want to go to the ER. And it's only an eye problem anyway. And we said, OK, 2009 is a long time ago, correct? We have work to do. So we worked. We gave talks, we sensitized the population, we wrote little articles, we went everywhere. And in 2013, uh, in, um, the group in Minneapolis said, oh, let's do a repeat survey. We've progressed so much. We've done so much work with the American Academy of Ophthalmology and the retina specialist. And so they did a survey, and this time they surveyed U.S. neurologists and U.S. retina specialists who are the ones who see this, those patients with acute CIO. And they ask us, what do you do with a patient who has a CIO within 12 hours, okay? A 12-hour-old CIO. You see the patient within 12 hours of vision loss. And 18% of ophthalmologists send their patient to the ER, and the neurologists, they're pretty stable. 75% still do it. So we actually made it worse by teaching them we lost about half of our ophthalmologists who would send patients to the ER. And the retina specialists were really upset with this survey. They didn't like it because the results were presented at the American Academy of Ophthalmology at the, the retina subspecialty uh, day. And they were so angry. They said, are you kidding? We can't send these patients to the ER. They have to wait nine hours, and you don't do anything anyway. We said, OK, we have more work to do. And I think. One of the main reasons why there is still this strong belief uh, within not just the ophthalmology community, but also many neurologists believe it, why there is this strong belief that, after all, retinal ischemia is better than uh, cerebral ischemia, it's because of this paper. 
And um, this is, everybody I think is aware of this publication in 2001 by Oscar Benavente in the New England Journal of Medicine. And this publication reported the outcome of the subgroup of patients with retinal transient ischemic attacks who were included in the NASET study. And as you remember, the NASET study was to evaluate the benefit of carotene and arterectomy in patients with tenosis greater than 50%. And patients were randomized medical treatment, which at the time was aspirin, period, versus medical treatment plus carotene and arterectomy. And what the NASET study showed is that the risk of stroke after a retinal TIA was not as high as the risk of stroke after a cerebral TIA, and that you needed to, the need for carotene and arterectomy did not really emerge as strongly uh, statistically significant in the subgroup of patients with retinal TIA. And so you can see that the title of the article is pretty benign. You don't know what they are going to tell you when you read the title, okay? Prognosis after transient monocular blindness associated with carotid artery stenosis. The abstract is horrible. The last sentence of the abstract says that the prognosis is good. And nowadays, as you know, most people just read the abstract and the title. They don't read the paper. When you read the paper, it says that the risk of recurrent TIA or stroke after retinal TIA is as high as 24.2% at three years. And at the time, 2001, we were looking at the risk of stroke at one year, three years, five years, without looking really at subgroups. It's later that we started saying, but wait a minute, those 24.2%, do they happen really within the next three years or do they happen within the next months? And we know now that the risk is way higher within the next two days, a little bit less during the next week, a little bit less within the next month, and that if you make it beyond three months and have not had a stroke, your risk is actually very low. And that if you want to really have an effect in terms of secondary prevention when addressing this group of patients, you need to act extraordinarily quickly to capture the strokes that are going to happen within the first few days after the retinal TIA. So this paper basically told the neurologist, don't worry too, too much about retinal TIA, it's going to be okay. And this paper told the ophthalmologist, don't do anything with them because they don't even need carotid surgery anyway. And we were done. And until last year, the American Board of Ophthalmology was still using the data of this paper on the board certification exam for ophthalmology resident, okay, and uh, for ophthalmologists, and emphasizing again the results of the NASET study over and over and over. And this is a spectacular study, but it's so old. We are many, many years later, and we know better now. So the NASET study came in the middle of many, many studies which emphasize that cerebrovascular and cardiovascular morbidity is high in patients with acute retinal ischemia. And here I'm lumping transient vision loss with branch retinal artery occlusion and central retinal artery occlusion. And I'm only showing you a few numbers emphasizing how large some of those studies are. These uh, patients are not so common. We don't see a patient with central retinal artery occlusion every day at all, okay? and. Uh, Already 1991, Hanke, stroke neurologist in, in Australia, and for 99 patients, and then the NASET, they had 198 with transient vision loss, and then a German study, 2007, the same people who, who evaluated thrombolysis in CIO, BIO, and then Hayway, 2009, and you see 400 patients, and then since 2012, six cohort studies, mostly published in Asia, and I think the reason why they come from Asia is because they have registries and are very well organized to systematically collect such information, including pretty much 30, more than 3,000 patients with CIO, BIO. And what these studies show us and emphasize is that this patient population has a very, very high prevalence of major vascular risk factors. Up to one third of patients has a carotid stenosis, which potentially would require surgery. Up to 50% of patients are found to have some kind of cardiac disease, whether it's cardiac ischemia or atrial fibrillation or um, paroxystic uh, uh, atrial fibrillation quite often. Up to 50% of 
and then they have a high risk of stroke and a high risk of cardiac ischemia and vascular death. And what the NASED study had already emphasized is that despite the fact that patients with acute retinal ischemia may have a lower risk of stroke than those with acute cerebral ischemia, the risk of cardiac death and cardiovascular death is as high in the population of patients with uh, acute uh, cerebral ischemia. And so we, we ended up changing our strategy when addressing ophthalmologists. We ended up telling them, all right, look at the patient. Patient had a retinal TIA or a retinal stroke. The patient is going to die. You do not want the patient to die in the eye clinic. And they said, oh, no, no, no. You don't even, and if you want to delay the care of this patient, you need to measure the blood pressure. I mean, how can you see a patient with acute retinal ischemia and not even check the blood pressure? Most ophthalmologists do not check the blood pressure. No ophthalmologists do. Most eye clinics don't even have a blood pressure cuff. So when we said, you know, an eye evaluation takes very, should be very fast because they see a lot of patients. If you start spending five minutes trying to figure out how to make the blood pressure thing work, you're done, okay? And so we said, so what we told our retina specialist is you have two options. You send the patient to the ER right away, or you check the blood pressure. What do you want to do? I send the patient to the ER. I said, okay, that's fine, that's good, that's good. And, and we realized that we were not using the right words, and hopefully things are beginning to change. I'm not going to go into the detail. I just want to show you a few uh, of the numbers of those cohort studies, because these are extraordinary studies coming uh, most, you know, Taiwan, Korea, uh, for two of those studies with numbers 688 patients with acute retinal ischemia. These are beautiful studies. We just keep emphasizing that when you have a patient in the eye clinic sitting on the chair with an eye a retinal stroke, there is a very good chance that the patient has either uncontrolled blood pressure, paroxystic atrial fibrillation, undiagnosed cardiac ischemia, or uncontrolled diabetes mellitus, and that these patients are not going to do well in a very short time, very short term. And therefore, these patients need to be evaluated right away. The risk of stroke is quite high, going as high as 25, 30% within the next year, depending on, uh, on some of those studies. And these are the three other studies, again, just to emphasize the large number. And again, the fact that only one comes from Germany with this, and it was the EGLE trial. And the EGLE trial, which is the top one, was the uh, uh, German study, including patients with acute CIO into a intra-arterial thrombolysis protocol. So as you can imagine, it was a randomized prospective clinical trial, which was very well designed, and patients were extremely well followed, managed, treated, given secondary prevention of stroke by stroke neurology. So the ideal situation, and despite that, 9.6% of those patients had a stroke within four weeks after the CIO, emphasizing how uh, at risk these patients are from a vascular standpoint. So what we keep telling our ophthalmologists and retina specialists is acute retinal ischemia often reveals very severe systemic vascular disease, which is a different message. And there is an opportunity for prevention. And what we need to do is be able to predict the risk of vascular events to individualize acute management and prevention. Because CIO, easy diagnosis. You look at the eye, you know what it is. BIO, easy diagnosis. Transient monocular vision loss. Oh, this is so hard. We have all these patients who come and they say, and sometimes I see and sometimes I don't see, and then it's all gone. And you say, okay, is it a dry eye? Is it a transient ischemic attack of the retina? Is it nothing? Did the patient, you know, like, when I put my glasses, I see well. When I take my glasses off, I see all blurry. <laughs> is this a TIA or is this a, just put your glasses on? <laughs> and so, and unfortunately, this is what the general ophthalmology clinic is filled off every day. And so you tell ophthalmologists each time they say it's transient, send them to the ER. And that's just not going to work because 99% of these patients obviously do not have transient monocular visual loss of vascular mechanism. And making such a diagnosis can be quite challenging. And, um, and that's the group of patients that's very, very difficult. 
same thing as cerebral TIA, okay? I had tingling and then it went away. You know very well. Is it a TIA or is it I slept on the wrong side or I had a seizure or I had nothing or whatever? This is very, very hard. And so what people have been focusing on in the field of neurology, as you know, is identify the subgroup of patients with transient neurologic symptoms who indeed did have a TIA and then use all those scores, the ABCD, ABCD2, ABCDI, ABCD whatever, to try to triage these patients in the emergency department and identify the subgroup of patients with a higher risk of stroke. And so there are six articles I want to show you. You cannot miss those. And the reason why you cannot miss those is because those three articles were, this, were reported studies that were designed after the latest definition of TIA, and you may remember, big year, 2009, the American Heart Association decided to change the definition of TIA. When I was in med school, TIA was, if it happens and it goes away in less than 24 hours, it was a TIA, done. Okay. Now, if you have a transient neurologic symptom that you think is vascular, and you do an MRI acutely with diffusion-weighted image, and you find even a very tiny lesion, like here, hyper diffusion restrict, uh, for rest, restricted diffusion, suggesting acute cerebral ischemia that you see in the brain, even if the symptom goes away, it's not a TIA, it's a stroke. Does it matter? To stroke neurologists, it doesn't matter because you are already taking care of patients the same way but it helps identify a subgroup of patients which risk of recurrent TIA or subsequent stroke is higher than the patient who has normal brain imaging. It's exactly the same concept as what cardiologists have used for a very, very long time. If you have chest pain and it goes away, it's a TIA. If your troponin is high or if you have EKG change, even if the chest pain is gone and the heart is happy, it's not a TIA of the heart. It's, it's an MI, and the prognosis is not the same, and therefore the secondary prevention may not be the same. And so what people have then emphasized is looking at all the clinical scores and looking at the addition of acute uh, brain imaging with MRI and diffusion-weighted image in the subgroup of patients with transient visual or transient neurological symptom. It doesn't matter how good your clinical score is. The MRI trumps everything. As soon as you have an abnormal brain MRI, you have identified a subgroup of patients whose prognosis is completely different. And it matters because this is also the subgroup of patients in whom you have the highest chance of finding a major cause for the stroke, a major cause like a thrombus in the heart, paroxystic atrial fibrillation, or carotid stenosis that will need to be addressed emergently and not in two weeks from now. So, People started saying, well, we have those accelerated TIA protocols, we have those TIA clinics or emergency department observation units in which we can do a, an accelerated workup within 24 hours, and we triage patients. There are those who are fine, they go home, secondary prevention, follow with stroke neurology, and there are those who have an abnormal brain MRI or an identified source of emboli and those have a stroke, not a TIA, and they are being admitted, and they are being aggressively treated. So that's what the American Heart Association basically made clear in 2011, where for the first time, they stopped publishing guidelines for TIA separate from guidelines for stroke. They lumped everything. And like the cardiologists, they said, forget TIA, stroke, whatever. You have an acute neurologic deficit. You do your workup and then you figure out what to do with the patient. And it doesn't matter whether it's transient or permanent, you need to move fast. And so what those guidelines emphasized is that any patient with suspected TIA or those with acute retinal ischemia should be evaluated urgently in order to identify those at high risk of immediate cerebral infarction and cardiac ischemia. And those six studies have been published since 2012 and so were done after all those guidelines. And the first one, Boston 2012, Mass Ayanir, Mass General Hospital, good collaboration, excellent paper, published in Annals of Neurology, which you know is a very good journal. And they basically said, world well unit, when you have a patient with acute retinal ischemia, 
and you do a brain MRI, even if the patient has no neurologic symptom, you're going to find those tiny areas of cerebral ischemia in up to 25% of patients. That changes everything, correct? You tell ophthalmologists your patient only has vision loss, but the patient had a stroke in the brain. This is not the same patient anymore, not the same prognosis anymore. Okay, nobody noticed this paper. Nobody cared. The stroke neurologist saw it, and they said, yeah, we know, we've had the guidelines for years, that's what we've been doing anyway. Annals of neurology, do you know a single ophthalmologist who looks at annals of neurology? Okay, plus in ophthalmology, we have a journal that's called Annals of Ophthalmology. It is so bad, nobody looks at it. And so people, the, the few ophthalmologists who became aware said, Annals of Neurology, oh, it must be such a bad article because it's published in a horrible journal. I'm not even going to look at it. <laughs> Nobody noticed the paper. It had zero impact, zero. Two years later, paper from Korea, and I was the reviewer for this paper, and it was submitted to the American Journal of Ophthalmology, and it was a horrible paper. But the data, basically was spectacular. I knew the Boston study. I reviewed the data in this article, which did not even reference the Boston study. I don't think they had even seen it. And, uh, and they basically were saying in Korea, when you do a brain MRI with DWI, in patients with acute retinal ischemia, you find cerebral infarctions, and they show the same pictures as in the Boston study, here and here, in 25% of patients with acute retinal ischemia, same number, same pictures, same results. I'm thinking, wow, this is great. So we made them rewrite. I was on the editorial board of the American Journal of Ophthalmology at the time, and I talked to the uh, editor, said, you can't accept it. It's really a horrible paper. But you have to work with them to make them rewrite the whole thing because you want the data published in AJO. And it happened. And I wrote an editorial about this paper, and I will show you later. And so we were in, uh, hold on, I've been going forward instead of backward. So we are in 2014, paper from Korea, American Journal of Ophthalmology. And then 2014, two years later, Japanese study showing exactly the same thing, this time published in, in, an, in an OK journal, not a very high impact factor journal, certainly nothing uh, that ophthalmologists would be aware of. And then 2015, from Germany, cerebrovascular disease, they show the same thing. 2016, from Korea, in IOVS, so this is a very high impact factor in ophthalmology, they show exactly the same thing. This one got noticed. And then Germany, last year, the only prospective study looking at this, published in Stroke, shows exactly the same thing. So all these studies put together, and let me just show you very briefly some numbers. You see Boston, they had 129 patients. Korea, 2014, 33. The Japanese, very small, 13. But each of them had patients with isolated um, uh, retinal ischemia, very few with some associated neurologic symptoms. Germany, 213 patients, and 112 in a prospective study that was published last year. And each of those studies included patients with transient vision loss, branch retinal artery occlusion, central retinal artery occlusion. What all the studies showed is that for Boston, 24%, Korea, 24.2%, the Japanese, 30.8% of patients with uh, acute retinal ischemia had those tiny cerebral infarction. All the MRIs were done within seven days of vision loss, and all patients had a very extensive stroke workup. And there was a very strong correlation between finding those little cerebral infarctions and identifying the subgroup of patients at the very high risk of stroke, patients who did have cardiac source of emboli, symptomatic carotid stenosis, etc. And all six studies showed very, very uh, similar results. And this is just a composite of MRIs coming from all these six studies. And you see the kind of uh, cerebral ischemia you see. They are tiny. And the reason why they are tiny is because these patients are neurologically asymptomatic. These people didn't come to the ER with an acute hemiparesis. They came to the ER with acute isolated vision loss. And interestingly, they are not always in the same vascular territory. 
and suggesting that no, they are not reflecting the cause. They are just reflecting the fact that there is something really bad going on in this patient's blood vessel. At the time they have the acute vision loss, they also have acute cerebral ischemia, signaling that there is something going on with multiple sources of emboli in most situations. And so the diffusion-weighted MRI identifies a subgroup of patients at high risk, and then the second message for the ophthalmologist was, but wait, if you're going to do that and play that game, you need to do it very, very quickly because the majority of stroke is going to happen within the first few days after the visual loss, and therefore, you need to move fast. So what should be done from a very practical standpoint? Well, what we have been telling ophthalmologists is this. What should be done is exactly what is done by stroke neurologists when the patient presents with an acute stroke. And because the highest risk of recurrent stroke, cerebral ischemia, is within the first few days after vision loss, you need to basically make sure the patient goes to the right place to have the appropriate workup, like not tomorrow, not next week, right now, right now. With one caveat, acute retinal ischemia is a classic presentation of giant cell arteritis. You know, when you see a patient with acute cerebral ischemia, of course giant cell arteritis could be the cause, but it's unusual. It's really not what comes up right away. But when you see acute retinal ischemia, giant cell arteritis must come up right away. And what we tell ophthalmologists is, you get to be aware, you have to rule out giant cell arteritis clinically. You may get blood tests if you have a high level of suspicion to make sure there is no biologic inflammatory syndrome, and then you give the patient to a stroke neurologist telling them, it's a stroke, take care of it for me. And what we tell ophthalmologists, because then the ophthalmologist said, well, this is not possible, I can't send all the patients to the ER, and there is no way I can negotiate an MRI within one day. And we tell them, you don't negotiate anything, you don't do anything, you don't recreate the will, don't think. Make the diagnosis and then follow the guidelines. And what the guidelines say is, the patient must have an immediate stroke workup. And what do you do with the patient? You don't keep the patient. The patient does not belong to the eye clinic. You send the patient to a structure that has access to emergency care and is affiliated with a certified stroke center, which is what the American Heart Association recommends. So that's when the ophthalmologists start panicking, saying, but what do I do? Because they always send the patient to the urgent care center across the street, because that's the people they have a relationship with. And then the urgent care center takes their time, and it takes three days, one week, before the patient reaches the stroke neurology. And so what we have told ophthalmologists is it's super easy. Um, you're going to search, enter your zip code on the American Heart website, and it's going to tell you where to send the patient. So for example, you guys are here. OK, this is Seattle. And there are always structures affiliated that are stroke certified within a reasonable amount of miles anywhere. So I played in your state and pretending I was an ophthalmologist in the boonies. I found the smallest little town lost in the mountain. And then I would enter the zip code and search. And each time there is a stroke something. It may not be a primary certified stroke center, but it's, a, it's an emergency facility that is connected uh, to stroke centers and has the appropriate personnel and equipment to handle those patients, always within half an hour drive, always. And so I tell ophthalmologists, don't send the patient to the local ER, send the patient, I keep going the wrong way, I apologize, send the patient to um, uh, the emergency department that is affiliated with a stroke center and Tell them you had a retinal stroke. So this is what I tell the patient. Tell the patient, go to the ER, not just any ER. Here is the list of ERs that you should go to. When you show up there, tell them you had a stroke. And I tell ophthalmologists, do not send these patients to their primary care physician, cardiologist, neurologist, neuro-ophthalmologist, because it's only going to delay care. And more importantly, do not try to obtain the workup yourself, because it's a waste of time, and it's not what you're good at. And then while you're sending the patient to the ER, call the ED triage nurse and tell them, I am sending you a patient who had 
And then the mistake is for the ophthalmologist to say a CIO or a BIO or acute vision loss, because then nothing happens. Nobody knows those words. They are not part of the checklist that triggers the stroke pager and that triggers the stroke evaluation. So I tell them, tell them you had a stroke in the eye. And I tell ophthalmology, send your patients to the ER with a diagnosis of stroke in the eye. And that immediately triggers. We've had absurd situations where I would see a patient in my office, I'm across the street from the ER, and uh, make a diagnosis of acute CIO, and I will tell my fellow, call the ER, and I would explain the situation to the patient, and my fellow would write a very nice little note in the medical record saying, patient has an acute central retinal artery occlusion, and the patient would sit nine hours in the ER because it was acute vision loss, and the patient would say, I lost vision in my eye, and they would wait and sit because the word stroke was not included. And so, so that's important. And so meanwhile, we've been saying, well, let's educate the ophthalmology community to try to make that happen. And so I wrote an editorial in the American Journal of Medicine in 2014 to accompany the Korean paper. Nobody read this editorial. People hated it. And I even got letters, very nasty letters, from a number of retina specialists telling me, are you out of your mind? You're telling us we need to do MRIs and we need to send these patients to the ER. And I had to respond, you know how it is, you get a nasty letter and you have to respond to all of them, otherwise their letter get published and your response get not published, doesn't get published. I spent so much time responding to those mean letters. And then I presented this at the American Academy of Ophthalmology and if they had had ripe tomatoes, I would have been hit by them, okay? It just didn't fly, it didn't work. We didn't give up. And we worked, we, the North American Neuroophthalmology Society, put their foot down, contacted the North American Retina Society, and said, you have guidelines for the management of acute retinal ischemia, and your guidelines are so bad that it's malpractice. And when we started using the word malpractice, they started listening to us. And we worked with them and the American Academy of Ophthalmology to have new guidelines, which were published in December last year, and this is what I'm showing you here. And it's basically completely changing the way the retina specialists are supposed to handle those patients. So these guidelines are really not very good at all because it was written by two groups of people, the neuro-op people and the retina people. We disagreed. And so we would proof retina and change everything. They would proof our thing and get it back to where it was before. Like I would say, it's an emergency, send the patient to the emergency department, and they would write, it's an emergency, send the patient to the primary care physician emergently. And I would erase primary care physician, put ED back. So it went back and forth. So it's a paper that does not read very well, but it makes the point. And the message after this publication has been to tell ophthalmologists before you were not doing the right thing for the patients, it was because you didn't know. It was incompetence. It was not malpractice. Now you have guidelines and you see the American, of the American Academy of Ophthalmology calls it preferred practice pattern. Now you don't do the right thing. It's not incompetence anymore. It's malpractice. You're in trouble. And they said, oh, okay, I'll do it. And then the ophthalmology residents have a series of books that they have to learn from in order to, to take the board. And we the no ophthalmology section, read it completely the book which was just published this year and we have included this in the new book. So at least ophthalmology residents learned the right thing and the American Board of Ophthalmology has deleted all co examination questions relating to the old recommendation that were uh, dictated by the retina people. And then we said, well, what do people read? You know, they don't read the article, they read the local magazine. So in neurology, we have Neurology Today that tells us what the big journal were saying. In ophthalmology, we have INET, which is sent to every single ophthalmology with a member of the AAO. And we did a podcast and an interview with uh, to the three of us, Prem Subramanian from Colorado, Jonathan Trobe and, uh, and myself, in which we really hammer the message over and over and over. And I think that's coming out next month. 
And uh, we also wrote major review article for ophthalmology, which should be impressed by now. And we even uh, wrote a, an editorial referring to the ophthalmology article for the uh, major optometry journal. And we have been giving talks to op the American Academy of Optometry to try to teach them a little bit uh, what should be done. And that's where we are at this point. And so what to do, educate and help your local ophthalmologists and optometrists. The ophthalmology uh, review basically tells them, make the diagnosis, move fast, don't do anything. Call the local stroke neurologist with whom you're working. And more importantly, establish a network so that you know what to do the day it happens. So now, to reassure you, these patients do not come along every day. It's not like you're going to get three more patients a day with an acute CIO. I am very biased. I see tons of those patients. And if I make a diagnosis of central retinal artery occlusion every two weeks or three weeks, it's a lot. Okay? I make a diagnosis of branch retinal artery occlusion every three weeks, four weeks. I send a patient to the ER with transient monocular vision loss that I think is vascular no more often than once a month. So our stroke neurologists have not had to complain. If anything, we are streamlining uh, and triaging better uh, the, the referral. But what we are telling ophthalmologists is contact you so that they know what to do, they know who you are. And very often they tell us, well, our stroke neurologists don't want our patients anyway. And my answer is, I don't think so. It's because you're not talking to them the right way. But it's something that's going, hopefully, to get better and better within the next year, thanks to all the advertisement we've been doing. And the reality is the reason why we're doing that is not just the secondary prevention. We are really hoping that at some point we will have something that we can administer to patients acutely to reverse uh, retinal ischemia, whether it's thrombolysis or something else. And right now, we are not even in any position to think about which drug we could use because we see these patients way too late to think about anything. But there is a big clinical trial going on right now using intravenous thrombolysis within 4.5 hours of vision loss in Europe. And my gut feeling is that it's going to show good positive results. And if it works, it means we'll need to have these patients within 4.5 hours here. And for vision loss, it means direct access from Sam's Club to your clinic. That's going to require a lot of work. So that's preparatory work. Thank you.